quiet space to work and get things done, or you would like to switch up your work from home routine, then the growth workspace is for you. Stay tuned for more details. Mark your calendars for 20 years of making a difference. On September 11th, we will be honoring and celebrating Pastor Terrence and Lady Eva Lachey for their commitment to the community as well as uplifting and pouring into others from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. again on September 11th. We hope to see you there. Grace family all over the world, both here in Grand Rapids as well as those of you who support us from various places. Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing at Grace for the Nations Church. In the way of your finances and in the way of your giving and your seed sowing, I just want you to know that you're sowing into good ground and that this is a trustworthy place for you to continue to plant seeds of promise and hope. At Grace, it's our mission, of course, to reach the diverse people of the world by teaching biblical principles and life application of scripture. We've spent some time doing that and having taught and now adapting some kingdom culture codes, one of them in particular is charity. I would like to implore you to be charitable in your giving and to think about the fact that um, the pandemic has caused the church worldwide to suffer some loss. There have been people who were here that are no longer here and I mean alive at this time, but then there are also people trying to negotiate whether they want to believe in God or believe in the kingdom principles that we hold so dear. So I want to encourage you to keep giving, keep sowing. If you haven't had a chance to place a seed um, specific to advancing the kingdom of God here at Grace for the Nations Church, you can follow the instructions on the screen and, and do so. Sow a seed in good ground and know that there is going to be a bountiful harvest in your life. Thank you for giving to Grace for the Nations Church.
the risen King. You are 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 the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Death could not hold you down. You got up with all power in your hand. Death couldn't hold you. Death couldn't hold you down. No, death couldn't hold you. Death couldn't hold you down. You got up with all power, all power in your hand. You got up with all power, with all power in your hand. You are the risen King, yeah. won the victory Ooh, hallelujah you have won it all for me death could not hold you down no for you are the risen king Seated in majesty, yeah, you are the risen King. Hallelujah, he's risen. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, Grace. My name is Pastor Marlene Cooper, and today I will be bringing you the prayer focus. And our prayer focus for today is serving others with our hearts. And the scripture that I will be reading is 2 Corinthians 9, 12, 1 through 13. And it reads, This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Now, in the scripture passage, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to follow through in their commitment. They had agreed to contribute to a collection for suffering Christians in Jerusalem. The scripture should also encourage us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how are we showing you love and being obedient to you if we're not serving others? Lord, please give us a heart and a mind to serve others just as Jesus served. Thank you, Jesus, for being our example of what serving others should look like. We know that we should serve willingly, cheerfully, and with a giving heart. Help us to keep our commitment to you so that you would know our love for you and that, you, and that we are being obedient to your word and that you will get the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Praise God. We're going to get right into the message. There is something that's burning in my heart that the Lord has revealed to me regarding where we are now in a syncopation of time. We have a lot of different liberties that we didn't have a few years ago. And now that we have these liberties of going about and moving and gathering, we have challenges. I have a challenge. You probably have a challenge too in the area of priority, prioritizing. And I want to talk about it from a personal perspective because I've taught many times before about making God a priority. But when we look at it more complex in a more in a deeper way, we have within us both the will and the ability to do his good pleasure. But we also have within us our own will and our own desire to find pleasure within ourselves. So how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we spend our interest or our focus, how we even dream and how we fathom the, the next thing in our lives really has everything to do with how we prioritize God. Now, prioritizing God, I'm sure that anybody that's, that's uh, uh, absorbing this message would say, oh, God is first 
first in my life. And we quote scripture oftentimes about seeking him first. But when we really look at it, how much time do we spend with him? Um, where is he on our agenda of daily activities? And how important is he when we're making major decisions? In addition to those things, we have to consider that God is everywhere at all times and he knows everything about us, even before we can think it. So, so we're challenged in being able to be transparent and honest about God being a priority in our lives. Let's pray over this word before we share it. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for another day, another day to worship you, another day to be alive, another day to experience your brand new mercies that are new every morning. Speak to us through these scriptures and speak to us through this message of inspiration. Speak to us that it would be food to our very souls. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we're able to apply the principles being taught in this pulpit, as well as others around the world, bless the people of God to be enriched, to grow, and to bolster in our efforts to advance your kingdom in the earth. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a scripture in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse number 34. I'll share that one scripture and begin to build around this. Now, this type of teaching is a little different because I'm going to look at that scripture in isolation, and then we're going to look for opportunities to apply it principally to our lives. And so this expository type teaching is to take the context of what's in the verse and bring it into our lives. As long as it's qualified, it's legal. And I'm qualifying that because the Bible scholars or those who like the Old Testament and the New Testament stories, we can weave some of those in. But I think it's imperative that we spend a few minutes just kind of looking at the scripture and applying it principally to our lives, basically in principle to our lives. So it says this, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, or there will be your heart also, depending on your translation. In essence, what the scripture is telling us as Luke records the, the words of Jesus Christ himself, as he teaches his disciples and as he talks to those who are not only a part of his ministry, but whose lives have been completely changed as a result of encountering Christ, we've got a few witnesses, we are now being compelled to review, assess, maybe even recalculate where our treasures are and how our heart operates in relationship to treasure. God looks at us as being his most valuable treasure, so we know that God's heart is with us and that wherever God's heart is, God's love is and God's power is and God's presence. So really what we want like to extrapolate or pull from this is prioritizing the presence of God, not just prioritizing God, but prioritizing the presence of God. From Old Testament to New, throughout from Genesis to Revelation, we see that the presence of God through the power of His Holy Spirit, through the manifestation of His Son, and through just the creative omniscience of God Himself, we have never been without the presence of God. One psalm actually says that if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the heavens, you're there. And if I made my bed in hell, you're there. Wherever we are, God is. But is the presence a priority in our lives? Is the presence of God a priority, the most prioritized things in our lives? By definition, when we look at priority, we have to think about the fact that a priority is um, just simply what you make is most important, what you deem as being the condition of something as being regarded or treated being more important than something else. So there is a comparison. I know none shall compare to the Lord, right? But when we comparatively uh, uh, sort out time we spend on social media and the time we spend with God or the time that we spend gathering with friends and loved ones or having a good meal and the time that we spend in God's presence fasting and praying, we weigh the odds and we see that the outcomes are a reflection of where our treasures are. I can get your checkbook or maybe even your registry of electronic transactions and see exactly where your priorities are. I was convicted by this. I was convicted because um, I was charged uh, an erroneous charge on my, on my account. And so I contacted my, my financial institution and said, we need to check this out because um, that subscription was, was canceled. And they were constantly sending you know, messages that um, they attempted to, to um, bill my credit card for a product that I did not order and did not want. So in, in sorting it out, I got an opportunity to look at all of the transactions on the registry or my electronic transactions. And I mean, I've got coffee, and I'm not a real big coffee drinker. I've got meals and snacks that I really didn't need. I've got frivolous things that didn't necessarily amount to my treasure being with God. 
Now, of course, my tithe, my offering, the things that I give unto the Lord, my benevolent activities, that's all there. But it's running a close second to the things that bring me pleasure or things that I desire or things that have nothing to do with advancing the kingdom of God. So as, as much as you may like to think that Starbucks helps you get closer to God, it's not exactly one of those things that's listed in the, in the scripture as being tools or instruments that allow us to admire and admonish the presence of the Lord. Let's get to some, back to the scripture. So, so the priority by definition then is the fact or condition of being regarded or treated as more important. I would even venture to say most important. If something is a high priority, it is most important. Look at your relationships. There's nobody who would stay in a relationship when they're not a priority to the person that they're in the relationship with. How is God so obligated to us that we somehow are his highest priority, but he is not necessarily our highest priority? Now, think for a moment about how we could argue this because, you know, I go to church. Well, what if your church only meets a couple of times a month? Or I read my Bible. Or what if you only read your Bible once in the last 26 days? Or I fast and I pray. You know, you forgot to eat and you pray because you almost got hit in a car accident and now you're thanking God for sparing your life. I'm not being critical, but I am in somewhat chiding you to think for a moment about how we prioritize God when it comes to the decisions that we make, the people that we hang out with, the things that we um, decide to do. Now, whether we take a job or whether we pursue another um, job offer or career, even in things as intimate as what time we go to sleep and how we relate to food. These are all things that I believe, and I'm coming under the conviction of the word of God, that if we seek first him and his kingdom, his righteousness, then everything else is going to be added. I was praying with a man of God, wise man of God, talking to him about some health challenges that he had. And he says that I asked him what is different now that he's gone through the health challenges. He says, you know, I prayed and asked God to give me a healthy relationship with food. I use that as an example because when we don't have a healthy relationship with the things that enter into our bodies, that enter into our, our very being, then we are literally at the whim or the demise of whatever it is that we took in. Which means if I eat junk, junk come, becomes a part of who I am and I become a junkie, a junk filled person or I'm producing junk because what comes out of me is really what has gone into me. And even through a process, it comes out as either pure or impure. So pure in is pure out. Impure in is impure out. And so when we think about our priorities with things such as time and sleep and food and spending time with the Lord in his word, studying or sharing even the word or witnessing or maybe even acts of kindness to, to those who may not be as blessed as we are, we have to fall under the conviction of we can do better. I think that that would be worth either typing in the chat or maybe even saying to yourself, I can do better. I'm, I'm actually not preaching anything to you that I've not preached to myself as it relates to spending the rest of this year. We are now moving into the end part, the second half, well into the second half, of this year that we never thought we'd see. This year that we probably were curious back two years ago of whether or not we'd make it this far. But since we've made it this far, we have to make the declaration that God didn't bring us this far just to bring us this far. That we're here for purpose, we have some destiny, there's order, structure, desire, outcome, all mapped out for us in, in God's plan for our lives. But if we don't prioritize His presence, not just prioritize him, because we can talk about him etherically. We can talk about him and in our minds, we can say God is a good God. He's a big God. He's an awesome God. In fact, God gives us the ability to talk about God, but we're not God, but we need his presence. We need his presence in our lives. Let me share this with you in the scripture, and then I'll give you three really basic elements or three basic steps or three basic uh, practical tips on, on really what we could do in order to prioritize the presence of God. Now, let me break down the presence of God. I'm not just talking about the ability to speak in tongues or chills and, and goosebumps. Those things could come with the cold or a flu or anything. I'm talking about the real presence of God that lets you know that you're um, at, at His will and at His command. When the presence of the Lord shows up in your space, you're no longer in control. Although we can control our own bodies, we yield ourselves when we are truly in the presence of God and we become almost uh, lifeless because we're drawing from the life that He gives us. I'm trying to describe it, but I'm sure there's some people who've experienced it, who've experienced the presence of God in a way that is far more 
um, indescribable than it is something that you can tell somebody about. All I know is there is a difference between when the presence of God is here and when I don't feel the presence of God. Now, I said a little bit earlier is that God is always with us. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. What the, 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 the missing link is our acknowledgement of his presence because he's present right where you are right now, whenever you are watching this message. God is present here right now in this room. And when I leave this room, I'm taking him with me. But if I show back up into this room, God's presence is in this room. Now, he doesn't just wait in dark places for us to for him to show up. What happens is that we carry within us the capacity or a container of sorts, our heart, where we can place him on the throne of our hearts. And then his presence is made special or prioritized. We acknowledge his presence by coming before his throne and bowing in total submission to who it is that that God is, recognizing that it's he who made us and not we ourselves. I want to share this scripture with you, and it was written by the psalmist David, and we find it in one of the earlier psalms, Psalm 16, Psalm 16, verse number 11. It simply says this, and I'll, and I'll read it from the King James Version and then another translation. It says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures evermore. The English Standard Version of the Bible says this, you have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Evermore and forevermore are the same words, but the English Standard Version does a better job of explaining that forever is before ever comes. Forever, which means that when we move into today, yesterday it was tomorrow. And so the presence of the Lord was was at our disposal even yesterday, although we needed him today. I'll make that even clearer. The presence of the Lord moves with us. He goes before us and he's our shield and buckler and our rear guard according to the scripture. But because he resides on the inside of us, the larger we make him, the greater acknowledgement of him, the greater his presence. And the greater his presence, the greater the opportunity for him to be the God that not only he promised to be, but that we know he is. You see, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a, a comforter to those who are without comfort. He is a healer to those who are sick. He is a shield to those who need shelter. He is food to those who are hungry. He is peace to those who have derision in their minds. So he is everything that we need right at the exact moment, time and space in which we need him to be. But he's not a vending machine, which means that we must seek him and go after him in order to have that presence and to make that presence a priority. Three very basic elements. One, we should start every day with prayer and time with God every single day. Every day, start every day with prayer and time spent with God. You may not be able to get in a full hour of devotion, but there are people who get up at the crack of dawn to go work out. Well, just before the dawn cracks, perhaps you could spend some time in cracking the Bible or maybe even your lips to say, thank you, Jesus, to say glory to God. Thank you for another day. Before my heat, feet hit the floor in the morning, I'm giving God thanks and gratitude and I'm recognizing him for being the one who made me. When I can feel my limbs moving, I give him glory and honor because of who he is and what he's done and what I'm expecting him to do for the rest of the day. I don't start the day just by asking him things, but acknowledging his presence and making his presence a priority before I begin to make my plans and take them into action. Another thing is to connect with others in the body of Christ. That's an important thing too because the Bible tells us that no man lives unto himself and no man dies unto himself. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. We belong to him. And so the admonition is that we connect though with others because as the times of evil draw closer, people are beginning to forsake the assembling of themselves according to what the scripture says. And in them is rooted a spirit of unbelief and people are beginning to divide themselves and there's dissemination even in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about just the church, I'm talking the body of Christ. So we have to find other Christians, other people, iron sharpening iron, to, to, to spend some time with and connect with. We're members of the body of Christ. If my hand was floating down the street without my arm being attached to the rest of my body, that'd be a very strange occurrence. And so when you think about your individual Christianity, you're connected to the body. You are a part of the body somewhere and you fit. 
you fit and you must find a way to connect. Otherwise, we're rogue members. And I'll talk about that in another message. But there are rogue members in the body. And whenever there are radical agents inside of our body, they turn into cancerous cells. And so we got to think about being connected to a healthy body and being connected to the body that we can help produce health for. The third and last thing is to also find and make some time for a Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest that is spoken of in Scripture from Genesis all the way to the end of the book speaks of a time in which we only prioritize God. We get seven days a week, one of them should be our Sabbath rest. If we get 365 days out of the year, how many of them are you willing to give unto the Lord? If you have 26 meeting times or 50 services or however the aggregate number is, how much do you prioritize a Sabbath with God? Sabbath means that I'm not going to do any labor, any hard work that will advance me, but I'm more than willing to submit myself to the work of the Lord and spend time with Him. There's an entire denomination of people who practice a Sabbath rest. We can learn a lesson from that. But I think it's important for us to understand the Sabbath and understand when it's time for us to be about the work of the kingdom. And both of them go hand in hand. Without one, you really can't be strong or, or very valid in the other. Without the work of the Lord, we really don't deserve the Sabbath. And without the Sabbath, we are not equipped or prepared to do the work of the Lord. So in essence, what I'm saying is that we need to find balance in prioritizing the presence balance in prioritizing who God is, where we want Him in our lives, and seeking Him first. And in doing so, I honestly believe, and I'm a firm, firm, firm believer in the Word of God when it is true. It is true that when we seek Him, we'll find Him. When we knock, the door is open. When we ask, it'll be given according to His will. But we must prioritize His presence. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the time that we spend in Your Word. We thank you because your scriptures never lie. They tell us the truth. And these that we've brought out illuminates to us that we need to spend some time with you. Let us fall under the conviction of correction and let us move into a place where we can be obedient to your voice and where we can stay connected to the body, prioritize time with you, and also find the Sabbath rest. Father, I pray for someone who's seeking you and wanting to come to know you without all of the things that go with traditions and with denominational differences and even hypocrisies. Father, help us to be doers of this word and obedient in executing the word and living out as examples what it means to be citizens of your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, thank you so much for being a part of today's message. If you desire further prayer, feel free to reach out to us to that number that's on the screen. We want to be able to connect and pray with you here at Grace for the Nations Church. God bless. Thank you for tuning in to today's message and broadcast. I want to take a few moments here to check in on you, to kind of have a heart to heart. Do you know that Jesus died for your sins? Do you also know that you must confess out bid that Jesus is your Lord in order to be saved? Well, I would like to give you that opportunity today. It's the perfect time. If it's tugging on your heart, this is that, that time. You see, there is no time to delay. And so what I would like for you to do is just repeat this confession with me, okay? As we give our life and recommit our lives to Jesus. So, say, Father, Lord, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that Jesus is your son. He died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, please forgive me for my sins and come into my heart and my life and become my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. And because you died, I am saved. Amen. And if you made that confession, I would like to congratulate you officially into the body of Christ. Here at Grace for the Nations, we would love to help you along this lifelong journey. If you made the confession, please connect with us and someone will be in contact with you. And we hope to see you soon or even at one of our in-person services. 